Here we go. All right, fantastic. Um, so welcome to the Sydney DevOps meetup. Uh, I am Lindsay and my co-organizer Michael is lurking somewhere in the background. Um, before we start, I would like to do a quick acknowledgement of country. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the country throughout Australia, which in my case is the dark and young people. And we recognize their continuing connection to land, waters and culture with our respects to their elders past and present. Sovereignty has never been ceded and treaties have never been signed. It always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Well, lovely to have you all here in the September meetup. Uh, quick refresh on the code of conduct before we get stuck into it so we don't tolerate harassment of meetup participants in any form or communication should be appropriate for a professional audience. Please remember that harassment and sexist, racist or exclusionary jokes are not appropriate here. The great thing about doing this on Zoom is that it's really easy for me to boot you. Haven't needed to do that yet, but the option is always there. So let's get stuck into it. For tonight, uh, this is the agenda. Um, so we've got the intro, which is literally the thing that you're listening to right now. Um, then I'm going to go uh, introduce our first speaker in talk number one. Uh, we're going to do a quick events and job section in the middle, and we're going to roll into talk number two. So hopefully have this all wrapped up in about an hour and you can get back to um, maybe lockdown life, maybe not lockdown life. Um, it sort of depends on where in the world you are. Um, just a quick heads up on the job section that we're going to do a little bit later. So if you are looking to fill a position, either you want to fill the position or you want the position to be filled, um, there'll be a 30 second slot where you'll be able to talk about any positions that you're hiring for or talk about yourself if you're looking for a new position. Um, and so we'll just get people to drop in the chat uh, if they're keen on doing that and feel free to do that anytime from now. Let me let the next person in. Um, so for tonight, the talks are, we've got Sven Rupert, uh, calling in from uh, sunny Germany, I believe, um, talking about DevSecOps, quick wins, and low-hanging fruit. And we also have Kieran Sweet uh, talking in talk number two slot about cloud standards with architecture decision records. So really great content tonight. I'm really happy that you can all be here with us and uh, with the fantastic speakers dialing in from quite far away. Um, so quick show of hands and feel free to use the reactions in uh, in Zoom or, uh, or you know, drop something in the chat or even like enable your video and let us see your beautiful faces. Um, who is the first timer tonight? I am. Awesome, lovely to have you. Anybody Me. else? Oh yeah, there's another person, fantastic. Lovely to have you here. We've I got am a... as well. Oh yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Got uh, new folks all over the place. Uh, well, it's lovely to have you all here. I guess the other thing that I'm sort of curious on, like the doing doing uh, these online meetups in, in during COVID, uh, sort of the great leveler when it comes to how far away people can be can be dialing in from. Uh, I'm curious to hear: is there? Uh, oh, can I can I get a shout out from all the folks that are uh, that are based in Sydney? I assume there are some folks. Hey, there we go. We've got a couple of thumb, thumbs up from Richard and Stephen and Tali and Philip. Fantastic. Lovely to have you all here. And uh, Ali Reza as well. Anybody coming from further afield, but perhaps still in Australia? Adelaide. Adelaide. Awesome. Lovely to have you here. Anywhere further afield in Australia than Adelaide? Got anybody calling in from uh, WA today or Tassie? Not that I can see. All right, and let's go a little bit further. Anybody from outside of Australia? Sven, you don't get to answer. Oh, okay, you just did, did answer. Very good. <laughs> Anybody other than Sven dialing in from overseas? Uh, not today. Oh. Oh, Sven, you might be winning the prize, uh, which is non-existent, but you, you get the honorary title for, uh, for this meetup. So lovely to have you here. Oh, we've got a few people in the chat as well. We've got Oh, Jim coming in from Shenzhen in China. Spectacular. Wow. Well, that's lovely to have you all here. Uh, it's one of the few silver linings to the pandemic. Uh, means that we can sort of lower the, uh, lower the barrier of entry to, to get into events like this. Oh, we've got uh, David coming in from Kuala Lumpur as well. Lovely to have you joining us from KL. All right. Well, the good news for all of you coming along to... Uh, this event is that the online meetups are going to continue until 2022. Uh, although we we did hit that magic uh, 
uh, 80% uh, first vax in New South Wales milestone in the last 24 hours. Um, and we are going to be in you know, having some form of opening up in the next couple of months. Um, we are going to continue with the online meetups until at least early uh, 2022. Uh, I'll be honest, I am not planning to go back to in-person meetups um, actively, uh, but, you know, hopefully sometime in uh in you know the first quarter, or maybe even second quarter, depending on how we're going with lockdowns and whatnot, um, we'll, we'll get back to some in-person meetups. So for the folks that have uh, that are sort of missing that at the moment, um, help is help is on the way. We will have some in-person meetups soon. Um, it all it almost feels a, like a bit of a a loss to to get to this point of having like well running and functioning online meetups and then to just digital to go back to in-person. So need to need to find a way to sort of keep that spirit alive a little bit. If you've got any ideas, please let me know because I don't. All right, let's dive straight into the first talk for the night. We've got Sven Rupert. He's talking about DevSecOps, quick wins, and the low-hanging fruit. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And Sven, I'm going to hand it over to you. Okay, so thank you very much so that I can be at your meetup. I was in Sydney before the pandemic quite, quite regularly, so at least every half year. So if the pandemic is done at some day, I will be there. Physically, definitely. So, uh, because every chance I got to go to Australia, I just took, but mostly then I spend a little bit more time. So traveling along the coast and all this stuff. So I'm missing it really, definitely. I'm missing it. And even my kids are asking, ah, damn, but so far we are now online and we are talking about the low hanging fruits uh, of death hang ups. Um, just a quick question um, who's working with security stuff already in in this devops environment pipeline whatever you want to say to it anyone there okay one shaking hand one two okay not so many good for me so i'm not repeating for too many people and well let's see so hopefully the connection is stable uh, we're just crossing the half of the world uh, and my the good thing is uh, for me it's just 10 a.m so kids are in school they're not destroying my internet bandwidth so this is good for you i think uh, or i hope the same is on your side so that we have a smooth connection okay let's start now the difficult part i have to start sharing my screen i got it done once today already let's see if i'm able to do it again so Okay, I hope you are able to see my screen now. And by the way, if anyone of you knows how I can get back the chat window. So if I'm activating the chat window and then I'm start sharing the screen, the chat window is disappearing. Anybody of you knows how to get rid of this behavior in Zoom? Uh, please, if someone has some idea, please let me know. Okay, I'm asking this question, I think, since, uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. I have no answer so far. And, uh, well, no future request. Okay, so my name is Sven. And what we are talking about today, I want to talk a little bit about the low-hanging fruits. The low-hanging fruits, or the quick wins, or how to start with staff cycles, mostly always the same. So I'm, I'm attending different workshops and, and, and presentations and all this stuff and people are coming through me and asking me, okay, so I, I have nothing. What, what's the best way to start? Uh, what, what is the key point to start? How, how to sell it to my manager? Uh, will it be expensive? Uh, do we have to change our processes and what else? Are so many questions. Well, it's easier as, as you can expect, but we will see how we can start with integrating security in this uh, DevOps world. Um, and I want to see the difference here between different parts of security. So the most people, if they're talking about security, they are just talking about vulnerabilities and cyber attacks, but business continuity or saving the business for or against the lawyer is maybe some part of security as well and sometimes even more important. Well, so, um, oh, I'm getting a bunch of tips. Right. Yeah, there's, I can read them out to okay. you so that, so that maybe you can see them or at least you won't be able to see them, yeah. you can hear them from me. Uh, 
Oh, we've got one suggestion from Richard Borges saying try Alt H to open the chat window. Perfect, perfect. I so I've done it already. I just want to get rid of this behavior and start sharing the screen and the chat window that's already there is disappearing. I don't know. Well, okay, so off topic. Um, by the way, my name is Sven. I'm from Germany, as already mentioned. And if you can see, I'm mostly in the bot. So every three minutes I can grab with my kids or by myself. I'm just going to the woods, spending there the day, the night, and so on. And it, with COVID, I, I got the idea that why not doing online meetups from time to time if they're recorded in the woods? So if you want to see one of my recorded talks, then maybe the YouTube channel is something for you. I have them in German, I have them in English, and then you can see how I'm talking about different topics in the woods, in the German woods, not so big as Australian ones, but still some nice places there. Okay, and by the way, if you want to have my shirt, you can grab one of these 20s, go to jeffrock.co, death of Sydney. You can do me a favor. If you like this talk, you enjoy it, please give me a big thumbs up there in this rating, and then my, my uh, manager will be happy with me and give me more opportunities to go somewhere on this virtual meetups. And on the other side, you can grab one of these shirts. It's not this one, this is from a conference, but we have this cool frog shirt. So now ah, you will see some, some stuff. So, okay, enough of this. Why we're talking about DevSecOps? DevSecOps is more or less, okay, other way around. What, what's going on in, in the industry? In the industry, we are trying to split up more and more our monoliths. Yeah, we try to go to this microservice world, maybe serverless world, whatever. What I'm talking about, you can do it with monoliths, you can do it with serverless, with functions, you can do it with microservices. The cloud native is more or less a little bit the excuse, the excuse for what I try to explain and what I try to highlight here at this moment. If you're going to these uh, different stacks and different levels of abstraction, we have something, for example, service-oriented architecture. Long, long time ago, it was with SOAP, RMI, and all this stuff. Now it's with different techniques. So, but the main idea is that you have different split up parts and they are start communicating. If you're talking about technology, can, can the technology help you to identify this bunch of use cases is good for one microservice and this bunch of use cases is good for the other microservice? Mostly not. So this is something a human has to decide. So if you have security aspects on the architectural side, so these use cases must be fit together and then it must be isolated or whatever. This is something the human must, must do. So the machine can't make this decision for you. If you're talking about the next layer, so how these pieces are communicating about the API oriented communication, the technology can help a little bit more. If you're talking about how to wrap data, it's not able to, to say what is good to send over the wire, but it's good to say how to send off the wire. And if you're talking about security, the machine is a little bit strong and helping you how to make this secure. So encrypted channels or whatever. But if you are talking about the infrastructure of every piece, could be a container-based infrastructure, operating system, whatever, we're talking more and more about stuff where the machine can help you more to protect it with firewalls, with analytics, with observability and all this stuff. Because we, we are going more and more to a technical layer that is not so dominant use or it's, it's not the use case, this abstract thing that we want to solve, but it's more technical thing where the technology can help. And if we are talking about the DevOps layer or the, in the DevSecOps layer, so how to code, how to build binary and all this stuff, this really this implementing stuff, the machine is really, really good in helping you against vulnerabilities and compliance issues. So based on these layers, you have to decide where you want to start. And I'm focusing on this DevOps layer, a little bit about this container or operating stuff. But if you're talking about security, security by concept is one of the important things, but tool sets are not helping you so good. So if you want to start with security and you want to have the low hanging fruit, you have to focus on the technical part because there the machines are quite good.
So we have different challenge why we have to change the way how to think about security. For example, with this shorter life cycles, with the smaller parts we want to create, we have good sides and bad sides. The good side is you're getting rid of old stuff soon. There's just a tiny microservice, you can throw it away, you can rewrite it fast, good. On the other side, with this shorter life cycles, instead of maintaining things, instead of improving things, we are throwing it away, writing it new. And with this, we have all the challenges of a new system with harden a new system again, okay? It will be even ch more challenging if we start using polyglot environments. So every microservice in a different language. If I'm a senior in Java, I'm definitely not a senior in Go. I will start writing Go. I will be fast in learning Go for sure, but I have to learn the whole ecosystem, the whole tool set again with all good and bad. And I have to think about security in a complete different way because the environment is a different one. I will learn a lot, but I will do all the mistakes. Again. So polyglot environments, even in one application, is even worse. So if you're talking, for example, about the Vardin, like it's an open source framework to write web-oriented uh, web pages, server-side web pages, you can write them in Java, but they will generate all this stuff via NPM and the communication and the server-side, client-side communication. And then you have two different life cycles. So you have the polyglot environment even inside your own microservice, a single microservice. And this is really a beast. You see one tech layer, but you have a bunch of other tech layers in the background with different life cycles. So vulnerabilities are really a lot of stuff we have to focus on. Okay, so now I'm cutting away all these different pieces around, so all these different nodes and Kubernetes stacks and whatever. I'm just looking at one microservice now. So the one thing, the thing, what you start coding, what, what you're working on. So you have an application where you're writing the code, then it's run, running on an operating system, that's the next layer. Then this operating system is wrapped in some virtualizer or maybe Docker full or whatever virtualizer you are taking, using. And then this is, abstract unit is distributed in this Kubernetes universe. So someone is managing resilience and failover stuff and, and heart beating and whatever, a huge system. The whole thing is that with every layer, we'll get a new way of vulnerabilities, different attack vectors per layer. And you can imagine it's like, like an onion. If, if you have a vulnerability inside your application where you're coding, where you're adding dependencies, then this vulnerability is existing all the time during, in all layers, directly or indirectly. What the most people are forgetting is the DevOps layer itself. They're focusing on this single thing. I'm writing now this piece of code, but the whole tool chain around it, it's a disaster. The whole DevOps pipeline is a disaster. Just mentioning the SolarWinds hack where this company was attacked and the person that have done it, uh, the group, then modified the build information or the build pipeline. So you had an attack against the supply chain. So just, just a question, whoever checked their own CI environment against vulnerabilities and start hardening it, whoever have done it, mostly people are not thinking about it. They are hardening their production system. They are hardening the application they want to deploy. But the whole tool set, the compiler, the CI environment, the test environment, the penetration test environment, whatever, they are not hardening this stuff. Or they are not maintaining it in the same way they are doing it with a, uh, with a production system. And this is a mistake, mostly. Okay, so um, I see it last here and anyone wants to check it later? Ah, there are slides from someone, okay. So in this single microservice node, we have technical requirements and we have domain specific requirements. And again, the machine is good in technical requirements, working against vulnerabilities here, but they are not so good in domain specific and um, related vulnerabilities. Can this use case misuse to do something against text or text or whatever? But it could be how I can increase the right to be an administrator. So you have to, Make sure that you are not forgetting one of the sides, but we are focusing now on the technical side again. And we are looking at two things, vulnerabilities, compliance issues on the technical side, because there the machine is good and you can start quite easily with this. There's a term shift left. 
I could remember this one if I'm just rotating the whole stack. Shift left means start as early as possible with removing vulnerabilities and compliance issues just to make sure that they are not existing in all other layers. And on the other side, if you are removing them early, it's mostly way cheaper than removing them later in production. This is the worst case, it's in production, okay? Then you have to stop your kill the environment, whatever, you have to roll back and so on. So it's way easier if you're doing it as early as possible. So what is as early as possible? But before we are going to this one, um, just check, for every layer you're using, you always have a corresponding package manager or binary manager or dependency manager that's correlated to exactly this layer. For example, the application that is written in Maven, you have Maven repositories. Linux, maybe Debian repositories. Docker has Docker repositories. Kubernetes has Helm charts and the corresponding repositories and so on. And the most people forgetting exactly, again, the tool step. So if you need more or less generic repositories where you have all these binaries in an immutable way so that they can't be compromised or you can replace them for new distribution of the whole tool stack. So for example, your compiler, your whatever you're using, your own scripts and so on. So you have for all layers corresponding managers, package managers or uh, repositories, they should store the binaries so that you're independent from outside, that you can verify these binaries and then you can make sure that these binaries are not compromised later. So with regular checks, fingerprints and all this stuff. So for everything, you need not only the binary, but you need the metadata around this binary. Talking about Maven uh, dependencies, for example, if you have a dependency that you are adding to your application and then this dependency will have different dependencies. So it, it's not enough just to check this single binary you need to understand the meta universe around this binary to identify what is correlated to this binary, what is directly or indirectly used if you're using this binary, because in production, it could be actively used then. So it makes sense to hold these binaries and it makes sense to understand this meta information. And at JFrog, we have this artifactory there we have all these package managers. We are understanding the metadata of this package, what we are managing. And X-Ray is a vulnerability and compliance scanner that can work not only with binary of all tech layers, it can work with the metadata itself. And additionally, if you're building a binary, we can use all this context information and putting it back to Artifactory in this build info part. This is important if you are um, coming to this topic of this ASPOM, the software builds of material based on this executive order from Mr. Biden. So if you're working directly or indirectly on some product that are used for the US government, you will be soon pushed to the requirement that you have to build a full list of ingredients with fingerprints and immutability of all these um, parts. If you're working um, for some product that's directly or indirectly used by the US government. Okay, so there's a question, if this AWS X-Ray, now X-Ray is a product from JFrog. X-Ray is more or less a binary and compliance scanner. I um, will explain it a little bit in detail. So <clears throat> we have two different things. If you start with this, we have one time to market and make or buy. This time to market, mostly in a company, it's Oh yeah, we have this use case. As fast as possible, it must be to production. And what happened? You're describing the use case, then everything is done. So you have this requirement. And after this requirement is defined, the whole production line is more or less independent. So you can produce it, you can test it, you can validate it, you can push it to production, no challenge. Why not with vulnerabilities? You have the requirement, there is a vulnerability, why it's not impossible to immediately change something because the requirement is changing against the vulnerability and then pushing it to production. Sometimes the companies will have inside this security pipeline interaction with humans in a way that they have validated, re-authenticate or whatever, and it's just slowing down. So if you're working against vulnerabilities, you have the same optimization goal with time to market for use cases, and explain it to the management in exactly the same way. It must be done as fast as possible. There is a requirement. All processes must be optimized in a way that you can do it as fast as possible 
that most stuff must be done by machines, not by humans. And all human interaction with verification or yes and no gates or whatever must be eliminated so that you can just work as fast as possible against this. Then make or buy. Mostly in this projects, you have the decision, should I write my own PDF printing library or should I add a dependency? A developer has to do it every day. It's the same like, should we learn it by ourselves or should we hire an external consultant? By the way, mostly if the external consultant is right because he's from external and hired for exactly this challenge, maybe we can think in the same way about the dependency. Maybe, maybe not. But the main thing here is that as a developer, you have to do exactly the same as a make or buy decision. Should I do something by myself or should I use an existing thing? If I'm deciding mostly for buy, because why I should do everything by myself, why I should reinvent the wheel, I'm buying something. I'm adding a dependency. I'm adding lines of code from outside I have to trust. And if, if you're talking about this one and just comparing how much I've done by myself and how much is a dependency somehow, I would see that over all layers, the amount of dependencies mostly is the most dominant thing. So in an application, I'm writing a million lines of code, but mostly I'm adding a few million lines of code with dependencies. So dependencies are the bigger part than stuff I'm writing by myself. If I now have to focus on the low hanging fruit, the quick win of security, I must focus on binaries. Because if I start scanning my open source code I'm writing, I have to deal with, with uh, machine learning, pattern matching, all this kind that try to identify the context I try to write down in my code. And this technique is not so good so far. They, they are working on it and it will be a really good thing, but it's not perfect right now, okay? But on the other side, if I'm focusing on binaries, I'm catching the biggest part of my application already with binaries anyway. And scanning binaries is a very, very straightforward thing. I'm scanning binaries, I know I have knowledge about the binaries and that's it. And then I have to replace or not to replace it, okay? And this will be even worse with every layer on the operating system. I'm just adding a few configurations, the rest are binaries. Docker, it even starts with a from statement. Kubernetes, Helm charts, it's the same. I, it's just a composition of, of a whole, huge text stack. And again, most people are forgetting the whole DevOps tool set, CI environment, toolings, compilers, and all this stuff. Even this are just dependencies. So if I'm looking at make or buy, whatever I'm deciding in my application, the buy part is by far the most dominant thing in the whole tech stack. What should I do first? Focus on dependencies, because with this, I'm mostly more than 80, 90% of my tech stack is a dependency somehow. So I have to focus on dependencies and I have two things I can get out of dependencies. So in the security world, I have different techniques. I have this static application security testing that's focusing on scanning binaries and all the assets I have. Then I have this dynamic application security testing. This try to identify how I can attack a system. So the system is running, I try to break in. This is mostly based on the most common vulnerabilities and this is done by machine learning and try to attack that. For this, the application must run already. So it's very late in the pipeline. Then I have this self-healing process this, um, that, that I'm this RASP. Um, so that, that I try to identify what part is just attacked and I'm deactivating it so that I can block an active cyber attack. But this is already done in production. I have this interactive security testing that is a mixture of dust and dust. But the easiest part and the fastest and the earliest part, whatever you do, so all these techniques are good, no question about this, but the basic, if you start, is just static application security testing because this is the earliest in the pipeline you can do, and it's focusing on the biggest part, the binaries inside your system. And you can do two things here. You can scan against compliance issues, means that you have to scan what uh, license is valid, yes or no, uh, if it is allowed at this stage inside your project, because the right license at the wrong place in your production line can cost a lot of money. On the other side, you have one-time effort in the beginning. You need someone who is able to decide what is the right license for this part of the pipeline and what's the 
um, black flies. And so what's allowed, what's not allowed. For this, you need someone who's able to uh, think about all this lawyer stuff, is able to decide it or must decide it. Then you have a list of valid license. And if you have done this one once, you just feed the machine with, these are the good license, these are the bad license for my case, and then the machine is doing the job. That's it. With vulnerabilities, it's a little bit different. So you don't need a lawyer in the beginning. You can immediately start scanning with a machine against vulnerabilities. And then over the time, you will get vulnerabilities, 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 and the human has to decide what to do. So how to get rid of vulnerabilities. These are the two sides of preparation, recurrent effort, and initial effort um, to start with compliance issues and vulnerabilities. But if we are talking about this one, then we have difference in behavior. Compliance issues are single points in your whole tech stack. And the beast here is that if you want to find, okay, this license is good, mostly the project is not changing the license anymore, but sometimes it's changing the license. For example, this Java EE, Jakarta EE, Eclipse EE stuff in the Java ecosystem. So we had a change of license. So you have to get this one. If you have a dependency and the transitive dependency is an indirect use dependency is a switching license, you need to know. So this is good that the machine is scanning it, even if this fluctuation is not so high. But on the other side, if you are able to find something that you have to um, eliminate, in compliance issue, then mostly it's a replacement. It's not a different version, it's a replacement of the module. And this is a base. You need a semantic equal implementation that is able to fulfill the same job. So this is, is a bad thing, finding compliance issues. With vulnerabilities, it's a different piece. Vulnerabilities are in one layer, but the combination of different vulnerabilities are the amount of attack vectors you have. So you have the vulnerability itself, and then you have all the other vulnerabilities, and the vulnerabilities can have lower uh, CBSS scores, this common vulnerability scoring system. By the way, if you want to know more about this on my YouTube channel, I have a small intro about this one. You have different components, how to rate this and how this fits to your environment. But even if you have lower risk vulnerabilities in different layers, they can be combined to a tech vector that are critical for you, okay? So here, it's really necessary not only to scan the whole graph once, it's necessary to get the full impact graph of vulnerabilities. So this vulnerability is used is in this jar, this jar is in this web archive, this web archive is used in this Docker file, this Docker file is used in this Helm chart running in this environment in production, okay? So you need to know the full impact graph to identify all the tech vectors of your vulnerabilities. There's one thing that is important to note. So if you're talking about vulnerabilities, the either thing to identify if they are known, what is the lifeline of a vulnerability and what is a part where I can jump in to, to work against vulnerabilities. So we have accidentally or on purpose created vulnerability, that's one thing. Um, if you have a bad guy, then he tried to hack something, compromise code, make him bad commit, whatever. Um, are we able to detect this one? Well, not, not really. So if I'm a security researcher, I'm, I'm able to identify it. Okay. But the regular developer or the most of us, they are not able to, to work at this line against vulnerabilities. You can do the best practice with your code that you're, that you're not producing code that is vulnerable, but the really analyzes about vulnerabilities in your code, this is a different beast. So we have this researchers and this is a bad thing because who is searching for it and why they are searching for it. They are searching for it because they want to earn money, the most of them. Some of them just want to make it safe and give it for free, everybody, but the most of them want to earn money. There is a huge market in terms of vulnerabilities. And this is leading the whole structure, how this is handled and what's the impact for us as a regular developer. So there is a vulnerability somewhere and someone is um, able to find it. If it's a bad one, he will just sell it in the darknet and will make money out of it. Can we do something? No, it's hidden for us. If it is a wire taker, he will go to one of these vulnerability database providers and will say, hey, I have here something or going to the product or to the company that's building this or to the team that's building this open source product, whatever. So we have some kind of contact and he tried to offer this information. So, and then it, who, who's able 
or who will get that information. It depends on the behavior of this person and there is no structure. You can't say, okay, this is, yeah, like, like here, here, you will get money here or money there and who will be the winner? If it is someone who just wants to push this information out for free, good, we will provide it everywhere for free, nothing. But the most, the most stuff is that people want to earn money. Then they are going to different vendors and saying, okay, I fear something with a CVSS value of, by the way, the CVSS is a very, it's not so straightforward because the hacker want to have a high CVSS value. The company of the product want to have a low CVSS number. So this behavior is not so trivial. Yeah? So, but he's going from one vendor to the next and say, okay, how much money? I have something, how much money? And who's the winner? Well, we don't know. With the most money, with the most experience, whatever. So, by the way, we have no control who will be the owner, the first owner of this information about this vulnerability. That means we have no impact about this uh, um, through this one, but at some point, this information will be public available. It means it will be part of some of these available vulnerability databases. What does it mean for us as a developer? Whatever vulnerability database I choose, it is the wrong one, definitely. So the only thing to work against this one is working with aggregators. So we have done the same experience and we at StrafeRock, we start aggregating different vulnerability databases. Even with a new acquisition of this company, we are searching actively for new vulnerabilities. So this is the only way. So don't focus on one provider. Use aggregator. Don't go to the plain vulnerability databases. Use aggregator. Whatever aggregator you're using, building a superset, it's way better than focusing on one. The next thing is, if this is available, it doesn't mean that's consumable by me. If it is in some of these commercial databases, I can't consume it if I'm not paying money. And this is a bad thing. Security, we're talking about time. We must react fast. And if you like it or don't like it, doesn't matter, but mostly the commercial providers are way faster than the free providers. If it is good or bad, no, no comment on this one, okay? But if it is even worse, if the security information is going straight to the company that creates a product, because sometimes you see just security fix, no detailed information, no uh, information about how critical it was and so on, it's just hidden some security fix. Okay, this is even worse, in my opinion. So at this point where you can consume this information, if you're paying or using a free one, whatever, the first time you can, you have access to some kind of resource to use vulnerability information, it's the first time you can implement or you can work faster with this information. So you can speed up with paying a little bit so that you have this information earlier, but whatever it means, in this moment, the information is consumable by you so that your scanner can work with it, so that you have the identification, this binary is a bad one, the time is running. And this is where you should focus on, not on selecting the right provider and all this stuff. First, make sure that from the knowledge is consumable until it's fixed in production is where you have to work as much as possible to automate everything, because this is the only place where you really can influence everything. And on the other side, for the most people, this is the slowest part. And this is sad. Yeah? This is really bad because you have everything in your hands and then you're standing in front of yourself and you're blocking yourself. And then the information is public available in some database. You have it quite far because you have this uh, knowledge inside your database and then it takes weeks to fix it. And this is a disaster because the most critical part is if the information is available and more critical is if there is a patch available because a patch is a very detailed information how to use this attack vector against systems. So the worst case is information is public available, a patch is available and you haven't fixed it because then this is more or less super cool to use for someone who knows how to use patches against you. Okay, so focus on your own things, okay? Optimize it. So what is the safety belt for you as a developer? For you as a developer, the best safety belt is a perfect test coverage. Because with a test coverage, 
you can immediately check if you have a semantic equal implementation against compliance issues, if they are working, yes or no. And you can immediately change versions if you have the knowledge about vulnerabilities, because fighting against vulnerabilities is mostly creating a new composition of the same components in different versions. And this must be done fast, so you need a very strong test coverage. I personally really like notation testing. If you want to know what's notation testing, I can give a talk about this one. But notation testing is a way, way, way stronger coverage compared to line coverage. If this is integrated in the CI pipeline, mostly the change between versions is way easier, way more smooth and faster. And this is exactly what you need. A change in your versions, and then it must be completely automated, checked, and distributed to production. This is the best what you can do against vulnerabilities. So an efficient dependency management has the highest impact against all the known vulnerabilities. Okay, so if you want to start with DevSecOps, focus on test-driven development and the hard test coverage so that you can react on the use case you have to change because there is the requirement. Here's a vulnerability. Okay. So this overall layers means you need the knowledge and the access to all binaries and all layers because we are dealing with management, dependency management. And you need a central place where all binaries are coming through. And not only for, and this is a mistake I see so often, they have this single point of grabbing all these binaries for the application. But why not using this one? For example, the Debian repositories, this management in, in your local system, what you can scan to feed your router, your infrastructure and all this. They're using this dependency manager or this, this, this binary manager in the middle and this caching mechanism and scanning just for the application. But use it for the whole infrastructure as well. You have it, so use it. If you're able to, to replicate Debian repositories so that you're not grabbing it from outside, from some mirror that could be compromised. Go over your own repository manner, scan it, block um, binaries with vulnerabilities so that they are not actively uh, used again in your system. And this means having the binaries in one central place, grabbing all this inside so that virtual place, it's not one instance, could be highly available or clustered or whatever, but I mean, this logical place where all binaries are coming through over all tech layers you're using, and then you have the full impact graph of all vulnerabilities. Oh, there is something in Debian, but this Debian is in this router use. So this will give you a good view, focusing on the binaries and then if you want to try it out, we have this free tier where you can use Artifactory as an aggregator for all the binaries, and then iterate to scan against vulnerabilities. I don't know, if you register, take three or five minutes and then you can play around with this. Okay, so far, what I can offer is, if you're interested, we can have a workshop and do this stuff practically. So harden a system, for example. If you want to know more about techniques, I already mentioned like this, what is mutation testing, why we should use it, or how this is integrated, or this built info, what it is, just let me know. We can have definitely an, a different um, talk or workshop about it or we are offering at JFOC this regular DevSecOps workshop. So if you have a clue that wants to have this hands-on. So otherwise, um, it would be now the perfect time for questions. Anyone there with questions? And uh, if you're a little bit shy and don't want to unmute, feel free to post them in the chat as well. And I'm happy to read them out. Well, so if you just start, think, scan binaries, let the machine do the job, optimize your production pipeline. That's the most thing. And shift left, shift left. That's most focusing on the CI pipeline. The last comment here is you can shift left even inside the IDE. I mentioned, I didn't mention it here, but we have this integration of the security scanner even inside the IDE so that if a developer adding a dependency in the definition, you already will get the information what kind of vulnerabilities are here or in transitive views or in dependencies that are used indirectly. So shift left means really go to the earliest point. What I'm not covering here is security by concept. This is something that is not covered by, by tools so far. 
Okay. Awesome. Well, it doesn't look like we've got any uh, questions in the chat at all, but I just want to say thank Since... you, Sven. That was a uh, that was a lovely talk, and I really appreciate you uh, dialing in from the other side of the planet to give it. Yeah. Thank you very much. And well, enjoy the rest of the yeah, night for you. Huh? It's what's time? Your time? Uh, it's quarter to seven here. Oh, yeah. early, early, early. Okay. That's right. We've got so, the whole night ahead of us. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Enough time to check a few YouTube uh, videos later. Okay. So, bye from my side and the next one. Okay, soon. All right, let me share my screen again and we'll get rolling into the next session. Uh, so actually quick thing as well uh, for any of that feedback that you want to give to Sven, I'm just posting a link in the chat there. You can go drop your feedback there. I know that he would really appreciate it. So events, we'll skip through this pretty quickly. Um, the, the main event that I want to talk about tonight was uh, DevOps Days, which was scheduled to happen on October 28 and 29 in Melbourne. Um, clearly, events have uh, unfolded, and that event is not happening at that time. Um, given if it were to happen, I think they were able to get maybe 50 people into a room. So not, not exactly you know, a great sort of DevOps Days event. So uh, I believe that the team is going to be announcing a reschedule. It's going to be in uh, the first quarter of 2022, uh, but still in Melbourne, um, still same same location, just a different time. So um, keep an eye out for that one. And as there are updates on when that's going to be, I will make sure that I talk about that in these meetups as well. If you haven't been to a DevOps Days event, uh, they are definitely the highlight of the DevOps space uh, you know, just globally, but also here in Australia. So the half day of structured talks, uh, the other half of the day is uh, open spaces. So just networking with other folks and being able to talk through different issues and, and you know, get, get feedback from your peers and ask questions and, and share the knowledge that you have with other folks as well. Um, so definitely worthwhile coming along to one of those. Uh, otherwise, there are a couple of other conferences that are coming up on us pretty quickly. There's P99Conf, uh, which is happening on October 6 and 7. That's going to be online. Uh, we've got SneakCon, which is happening on October 5 to 7, which is also online. Uh, and there's also HashiConf Global, which is happening on October 20, uh, 19 and 20, which is online as well. There are a couple of web directions uh, conferences that are coming up. In particular, they have a security one called Web Direction Safe, which I just realized I don't have a slide for, uh, but that's going to be in December. So if you're interested in that, um, uh, if you head to the Web Directions website. And yes, um, great call out there, Tris. Uh, LCA, linux.conf.au, I believe, I don't know if they extended their call for sessions, but they're definitely having a conference uh, in mid-January. If you haven't been to LCA, it's definitely one of the premier open source conferences in the world. It's definitely the largest one in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, so if you're interested in talking at that, uh, if the uh, call for sessions are still open, you should definitely submit. Uh, but it's uh, definitely a great conference to, to head along to if you're like really deep technical content. All right, so I alluded to this a little bit earlier, but we've got a job session. So the way that works is that if you are looking to uh, hire people or if you are looking to or looking for a new position, uh, so you're either looking to fill a position or looking to fill a position, uh, you've got 30 seconds to either talk about yourself or talk about the job that you're hiring for. Um, so I believe Kieran popped up in the chat a little bit earlier about some positions at Source Group that he wants to talk about. So I'm gonna let him go first. Yeah, cool. Um, this is a bit weird because I'm like introducing myself before I introduce myself. Um, yeah, so my name's Kieran. I work for Source Group. We're a uh, consultancy. We focus on cloud technologies, uh, AWS, GCP, a bit of Azure. Uh, we've got open roles for uh, technical consultants in Sydney, Melbourne, and Auckland and Wellington. Um, in my realm, we do also have other open roles uh, in Asia, uh, Singapore, Malaysia, uh, and also North America, specifically Canada, Toronto, uh, which is out of my wheelhouse. And one day when people can fly, they might be able to go and apply for those ones and move there as well. But if you are in those regions, you do know people who are looking for work. Um, sourcegroup.com is our website. We have a uh, link to recruiting and talent. Uh, check it out, or you can hit me up on LinkedIn. Just Google me, there's not many other Kieran suites around. I'm pretty easy to find. That's it. That's my pitch. Awesome. Thanks, Kieran. All right. Have we got anybody else that is looking to spruik a job or spruik themselves? Feel free to unmute and go for it. Or it might just be Kieran for tonight. 
counting to eight in my head, waiting for people to. No, oh, not happening. Great. Oh no, I see another another un unmuted there. We've got a uh, Muhammad. Um, are you looking to talk, Muhammad? Hi, uh, my name is Muhammad Aves. Uh, I'm recently master graduate from university uh, in Sydney. Uh, so I have a four months internship in DevOps role. Uh, so I'm just looking for a junior DevOps role or junior cloud engineering in a field. So if you have any role or any opportunity, kindly refer me or anything which helped me. Awesome. Thank you for uh, thank you for speaking out, Mohammed. It's really great to have new folks to the industry come and, and talk about themselves. Um, if you want to contact Mohammed, feel free to hit him up in the chat on the side there. Or uh, Mohammed, if you feel comfortable, feel free to, uh, to post your contact details on the uh, on the meetup event as well, so people can find you after the fact. Sure. Lovely. All right. Anybody else before we hand it over to Kieran for the last part of the night? All right, I have counted to eight in my head. It doesn't look like anybody else is uh, going to give it a shot tonight, but that's great. Thank you both, Kieran and Muhammad. Um, I'm just going to hand it straight to Kieran right now. He's going to be talking about cloud standards with architecture decision records. Kieran, take it away. All right, I'm going to uh, just I'm going to minimize all my messages and stuff because uh, I know I'll, I'll take any questions at the end. Um, just getting ready. All right, almost done. All right, moving things around. Uh, can you see that okay? Yeah, it still says that it's loading. I think we might be having a bit of the, the thing that we were seeing before when we were yeah. testing it out. Let's see how we go. Once it turns up, I'll flick to the first slide. Um, yes, there we go. Video off. I'm having some weirdness with my internet, but... Uh, all right. Um, look, thanks for having me. Um, so I'm just flicking straight over to my uh, to my introduction slides. So uh, yeah, today I'll be talking about uh, architecture decision records, especially specifically in the context of uh, cloud resource development, uh, but also wider ecosystem, um, you know, development uh, when you're building out sort of cloud platforms, products, uh, and other things. Um, so I guess first up, just a little bit about me. Um, this is actually a lightning talk, so I'm actually just going to kick off my timer, so I, I keep on uh, keep on time. Uh, my goal is 17 minutes maximum. So um, yeah, just a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Kieran Sweet. Uh, I'm a principal consultant with Source Group. So we are a consultancy. Uh, we have uh, some global reach. Uh, we were started here in uh, Sydney, uh, Australia. Um, my personal background is I started um, my career in uh, doing Linux and Windows system administration. I, I got pretty heavy into uh, configuration management uh, with Puppet and other, other products. That was sort of 10 years ago where I started learning all about infrastructure as code uh, when it was in its infancy. Uh, and probably for the last eight years since I've been at Sourced, uh, I've been working primarily with AWS. Um, I do a lot with it uh, currently um, and I'm pretty dangerous with the others. I've done a bunch of Azure. Uh, and I've tinkered with GCP um, and, and those kind of tools. Um, I like automating things. I've always liked them. Uh, I'm a pretty average coder overall, but you know I make do and made a career out of it. Um, but I also like helping teams be more effective uh, when it comes to, to scaling out teams and, and helping them automate and be more effective. Uh, my background is more traditional infrastructure, but I have sort of been trending towards a development sort of view on, uh, on technology for probably the last few years. Um, I do sort of write things up and throw them online at that URL, notes.curan.io. I do have a blog post that covers the content in this. Uh, and I've got a bunch of other stuff that I've been uh, sort of writing over the years. I, I dropped a, a white paper on sort of cloud patterns earlier in the year. Uh, I lurk on Twitter, you can get me there or you can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, I'll drop a, a line a thing out after. So that's a little bit about, uh, about me. All right. Um, so yeah, enough about me. I, I kind of want to talk about a, a problem space or one, one of a few problem spaces that I've, I've had to deal with this year. Um, so um, 
about 18 months ago, I, uh, I was engaged by a large financial organization to build out a, a Greenfield AWS platform. Now, this was uh, starting effectively from scratch, new technology choices, new reasons to do so. Um, and it was their strategic landing zone for all of their future workloads. And, you know, I got engaged into the organization and, you know, they'd already picked some of the tooling choices and things like that, but to build this platform for their applications, uh, it was an AWS platform first and foremost. Uh, they wanted to use uh, HashiCorp products to build out the full capability, the landing zones and things like that. Uh, so, you know, Terraform was first and foremost the tool of choice. Uh, they were using Terraform uh, Enterprise as well for, for some of this. Uh, and then things like Paco and other parts of that ecosystem were, were part of it. Now, this was landing applications across the spectrum of AWS's landscapes from Windows to Linux apps. Um, so there was a wide range of, um, you know, technologies in play. This also covered, you know, a lot of other, you know, serverless technologies, Lambda, um, and, and such uh, on there as well, plus a container platform was being built out there uh, and all that stuff. So when you look at the technology landscape for this project, um, we had all of the infrastructure as code stuff, plus we also had Bash, we had Python, we had Golang, we had Node.js, we had Puppet. Um, the list actually just kept growing. Um, it's, it's all in there at the moment. So it's, you know, it's a pretty big initiative. Um, so yeah, it's been quite interesting. Now, when the project kicked off, it was a very small team. And uh, you know, I was probably actually one of three people who started working on it. But the initial team composition started by, you know, about 10 people. They were all co-located, uh, you know, actually in Melbourne. I moved to Melbourne for this project. And, um, you know, we're all in the same offices. Uh, and the code base sort of started as a couple of repos, um, you know, with the, the core AWS platform. We split out things for, you know, network repositories um, and, you know, the core landing zones. We had stuff for repos for, you know, the, the actual structure of, of AWS's, um, you know, organizational structure and, and things like that. Um, and then we added different repos as we needed to for additional functionality that needed to be out of the, the core code bases as, as features. Now, as the project matured, um, the team began to grow. So what happened was, was that, you know, the shared services team came on board. They needed to build out SOEs and, and Linux uh, Amy's and automation. Uh, we introduced an entire new region of developers. Um, we brought people in from India. We got another 10 developers in New Zealand initially. Uh, then they decided they wanted to rework the network. So they brought in a networks team and said, you know, we want to move away from the squids for egress. We're going to go and have a look at all these new AWS network firewall stuff. So they came on board, started working on the code base. Then they decided we're going to bring the Terraform modules that the platform team uh, is working on out. We're going to give them a whole bunch of devs, another 10 people, give or take. Then we started onboarding customers. So another 20 people there who wanted to help out, you know, across the platform, uh, various skill levels. Um, and then, you know, we also had an operations team. We needed to kind of support the, the front door, you know, and, and that kind of stuff. So then, you know, things are ticking along and then the project got bigger again. Uh, so what we saw was that uh, the customer wanted more features. They wanted things to move faster, uh, very common. Uh, if in doubt, throw more people on it. So, um, so you know, the CICD team came in, five people. I can't, these are kind of finger in the air um, numbers, but it does represent a holistic view of the, the kind of uh, numbers we're seeing on the platform. Uh, they wanted automatic account vending to happen. So they wanted people to get more Amazon accounts faster. So they got a, an enhancements team to come on and start working on the same code base, introduce new features, new repos. Uh, VMware on AWS came along and said, hey, like we want a whole nother landing zone. Uh, more people came along. Um, then they decided to build out a container platform. And uh, what else did they put in there? Then, <laughs> and then, you know, they were like, actually, we want innovation accounts. So we want to give people like free reign over here. So more features. Uh, and the list actually just kept going on. Um, what ended up happening is we probably have about over 100 developers one way or another on this platform now, uh, building features, bringing things up to speed. Uh, and then COVID happened. And so this infrastructure project on AWS went from, you know, a couple of people in Melbourne to um, a fully blown remote development pro, uh, program of work, uh, a fully blown software project, really. 
Um, and all hell broke loose, really, to be, to be frank. Um, this is a good news story, by the way. Uh, things are much better today. Uh, but the cracks really started to be, be uh, you know, started to, to appear. Uh, and so what we found was is that the more developers that we had, the less output that we, uh, we were getting from them. Uh, the main observations were that many of the teams were falling short of their, uh, their sprint objectives. Uh, we, we found that there was a, a massive drop in developer output. Uh, and then the, um, the COVID remote delivery model or time zones and, you know, working remotely and not having that personal interaction um, really made the team struggle. So um, what happened was, is that we, we went and talked to the teams, you know, and we said, you know, what, what's going on? What are your biggest problems? And a big part of it was that code reviews and releases were becoming different, uh, difficult. There was a lot of tribal knowledge going on between the teams. Um, we found that when pull requests and things were, were going in, um, you know, everything was being named slightly differently. There were naming standards that were not really defined well. Uh, standards um, were spread out through multiple knowledge bases. Like there would be stuff in Git, there would be stuff in uh, Confluence, there would be stuff, um, you know, on the back of people's notepads. There was tribal knowledge, okay, go and call this person or hit them up on Slack or find this pull request and copy what they did kind of. Um, I think that one of the most frustrating things for any technologist is to be referred to about standards that aren't ever actually written down. Um, then other things started happening, like the language selections weren't clear. You know, we were mainly writing in Python until we were writing in Node. And, um, you know, it's really hard to, to be consistent um, when everybody's kind of doing the same thing different ways. Uh, and it was really hard to introduce further automation into the platform. Um, you know, I've always felt that standardization is the enabler to, to further automation. Um, and it was also really hard to bring on new developers. Somebody would come in with like really good skills and it was impossible to get them working quickly. Uh, and as a result, the, the relationships were, were becoming strained. Uh, what we found in the PRs in regards to this picture was that like, you know, four, four PRs that would all come into a certain repo and then like nobody wanted to rebase because they were all con conflicting and stuff all of the time. So what we really needed was a clear way to capture, socialize and collaborate on our AWS and, and related ecosystems development standards. So. It was around this time that there was a guy on my team. Um, I was actually seconded into the New Zealand part of this program of work. And there was a lot of experienced developers there. Um, and one of them sort of said to me, you know, we really need ADRs. And he kind of put me on to, to this concept. And now an ADR is an, is an architecture decision record. Now, what they really are are just small text files that capture key decisions with your software project. So. What they really focus on is recording key decisions and really focusing on the standards and what you're trying to achieve um, with that particular standard and recording it accordingly. Now, what, what they're focused on doing is not thinking about a full architecture solution, but a key decision you're making and recording it and placing it somewhere where everybody can review it. Now, they're really lightweight in nature. Generally, what we find is that we, we have no more than a title and an ID, a status. Is it, you know, accepted and, and applying to the environment? Or is it, you know, sunset because it's not applicable anymore if it's been replaced by something else? The context of this uh, particular decision uh, and the consequences of not putting that standard in place. Now, you encode the, the ADRs themselves uh, with this data in Markdown, and then you version control them in Git. Now, what's really cool about this is that it provides you a way to standardize and bring all of your standards for your program of work together, but it democratizes the process in that if people want to, you know, propose a change to it, they just open a pull request, you know, they, they propose their changes, uh, and then the team around them reviews it, provides feedback, and then when it's merged, uh, by the, the consensus of the team, um, it's then a standard. Now, the other cool thing about it is there's some um, 
there's some tooling around it to help you sort of work with the, the files in there. You, you don't have to use them. They're pretty simple. But um, if you look at the adr.github.io page, it does sort of frame some of the tools. They're all bash pretty much. So um, yeah, it really does help. Um, and this book doesn't exist. I just made that up because I didn't know what else to put here. So, so what I'll do is I'll show you what one looks like for uh, one of the, the projects that I'm on. So one of the biggest problems that we had was that everybody was committing code to uh, the repositories differently. So every PR was different. The commit messages were, you know, you could really tell who was good at Git and who wasn't very early on because of, you know, the types of commits and the PRs that were coming in. So one of the, the first ones, this is actually the number, number three, was this ADR we put in for Git standards. And what we wanted to do was we wanted everybody to be consistent with the way that they committed code to the code bases. And so, you know, we call out the context of why we're, we're putting this standard in place. And then we propose the implementation standards of what we expect for, for this particular ADR. So in this context, you know, we want to make sure that you know, the branch names are consistent. It contains the JIRAs that the code is referencing uh, for a feature or a bug. Uh, we wanna make sure that it has clear commit messages that explain what's going on. Um, we wanna make sure that they're attributed to an individual, not unknown at unknown.com. Um, and, you know, we wanted to squash them before we, we open the PRs. Um, we do have a little bit of an example around how to set this up. Uh, and then we also have a similar thing for the PRs themselves. So, you know, make sure that in GitHub, it's got a title, it's clear and untruncated. Um, it has a clear description, you know, why we're doing this, uh, what's being tested um, and, you know, update the Docker as you go. And then we have the consequences, right? And this is where we call out, you know, if we don't put this in place, what is gonna happen? And, you know, in this case, you know, we call out, you know, we're, we're struggling to scale if we don't do this. Now, what happens then is that we put these ADRs in, we open a pull request, uh, we bring them together uh, after team, the team's had a chance to review them. Uh, and then once it goes in and is merged to the, the master branch, like it's set in stone. Now, what we normally do is we communicate out to the team, this new ADR is in place. We generally have a cutoff or a cool off period for in-flight changes that don't align to, to be merged. Um, but once it's in, we change the way we work. Now, the other thing that uh, we needed to do when we communicate this out is to let everybody know in advance that these processes are, are in place. They are part of our way of working now. But then what we did was we then analyzed the environment for you know, quick wins that were, were causing problems. Now, one of the, the cool things about this, um, just to talk a little bit about the, the Git standards specifically, is once the standards went in and everybody started working this way, we were able to then put CI checks into the pipelines to say, if you don't align to the standards here, um, then just reject the changes like straight away. So it enabled a lot of automation early on. But once we started getting these in, we built a backlog of uh, priority ADRs uh, to be created. Uh, and then when they were defined and improved, uh, you know, and merged, we changed the way we worked, we communicated them out, and then we looked to enforce them further through automation. Now, on this particular project, um, the, the quick wins for us were the Git and PR standards, like that one day and night probably shaved off half of the pain points on this project, you know, of, you know, understanding changes, setting the expectations. We put a template in for pull requests. You had to tick all the boxes for that, that are called out in the ADR. Uh, and it really helped. Now, the other quick wins were AWS resourcing names. So, you know, we wanted to make sure that we had consistency on the resource naming so that it, it let us do compliance checks and security consistently and things like that. But we also put in place, you know, Lambda language standards. So, you know, we standardized for the platform on uh, Python uh, unless we, it, we couldn't use it um, for, for many different reasons. And then we also set in standards around unit test expectations and the standard tooling that we expect all code to, to fall under. Um, when we started looking at some of the modules that we're writing for Terraform, uh, we also looked to, to advocate, you know, Semver alignment and, and things like that for releasing code. Uh, the other one is that this one's in progress at the moment. Is you know we're we're in the, we're kind of stuck on a uh, an older version of Terraform. We are trending towards 1.0 or 1.x, and so what we're trying to do is introduce some new standards in our environment to uh, get us to that and provide a, uh, a, a set of standards that we want to. Um, align to over time to maintain it so that it doesn't fall a bit into disarray. 
So I guess the results of this were, were pretty profound. Um, so, you know, the main one is increased developer cadence. Um, there's a lot more time spent writing code than reviewing um, different code and different uh, changes being introduced. Uh, you know, we're really able to shift left and implement a lot of automation uh, into this. So, you know, we've got CI now that, that enforces ADRs and throws common errors to say, hey, you don't align to this standard, go and check out the ADR. This is sort of our expectation. Um, we're also able to take a lot of ambiguity out of what development standards were. We've actually been able to pass this ADR repo down to other teams and say, we recommend that you do this, um, you know, and, and they're sort of following our lead. Uh, people are a lot happier when things are written down. Um, and it's also when it comes to, you know, new people coming into the program, it also click, like draws a line around clear expectations around where the quality bar is for introducing code into the environment. Uh, and sort of, you know, having a checklist of have you done this, have you done this, are your JIRAs updated, things like that. Um, and also the, the big one is around the history as well is like there's a lot of standards that you might encounter in your environments and you're like, what? Like, why are we doing this? And, and so this gives you a really clear history of... Um, of why things are as they are. It might or not always be great, but it, it sort of made me think about like a mate of mine, he worked for an ISP and he decided he was gonna like change the way the network worked uh, because he thought it would be better. And um, he did it and all hell broke loose and he ended up having to roll it back. And when he was rolling it back, he found a post that seemed exactly like his problem. And it was by the guy who used to work there had um, tried the same thing, had the same problems, posted on Usenet and rolled it back. And he found it in the middle of his change. So, um, you know, writing stuff down, understanding the history is a, is, a, uh, is a really good, you know, good thing overall for everybody, especially at scale. Uh, and as a result, people are happier. Like this program has many different people, permies, different consultancies, and the friction's actually pretty low for... Uh, for, for a project this size uh, when it comes to, to collaboration and things. So yeah, it's pretty good. Um, that's it. I'm just over, but I tried my best. So uh, look, thanks for listening. I'm gonna stop sharing to see if there are any questions. Uh, I think I've already done my bit about we're hiring, but you know, uh, do, do reach out. I'm gonna stop. Sharing. Great, thanks, Kieran. Uh, any questions for Kieran while uh, we're working out how to stop the screen sharing? <laughs> Where'd it go? <laughs> I have a question. Yep. Um, hey, Kieran, it's uh, Jesse Reynolds. Um, oh, hello. Excellent talk. This sounds like it's the answer to everything. And I'm just wondering if there are any kind of limitations into applicability that are sort of top of mind. <laughs> Um, it does apply to everything. And do you know what's really interesting? It's, it's, um, I went out and looked at lots of different programs, ADRs, and I would really recommend you do it. I'll tell you what a really good one is, uh, the Home Assistant Project. So if you do any home automation, um, that's actually a really mature project. Um, and I found that their ADRs were very interesting. Um, people focus on different things, but um, you know, for us, it was actually low-hanging fruit was probably our, our biggest biggest challenge but um you do see some some teams implement them um at different levels um or they or they tell other teams look we we cover this bit and go look at other teams adrs for everything else does that answer your question yeah i mean i uh, i guess um could you i suppose it's it's really applicable and this is probably going to sound just a bit stupid but and obvious but I guess it's really applicable to a development team's methodologies, right? But I was just wondering if you could extend it beyond that to more organizational um, things. You definitely yeah. could. So one of the things that actually went in first is uh, team principles. And it, it was kind of one of, I, I reflect more on the team principles for this project a lot more now, but team principles was probably one of the things we needed to get the team aligned on first. So team principles in the context of this team is we make small in, small frequent changes or we, um, I'm trying to think of the other one. We do everything as code. Um, and so you can have higher level 
things like that. I do think they trend towards principles though, uh, which should absolutely be recorded as an ADR, I believe. Um, you could apply this to a business. You definitely could. Uh, yeah. Whether or not that's a good outcome or not, I don't know. I, I work with a bunch of business development dudes as you definitely do as well. And they hate using JIRA. Like they're a Salesforce okay. team. And um, as much as I yep. think they're wrong and they should learn because it's easy and it's great for us to track things, um, using ADRs at, for higher levels up the chain, you may struggle. But I look forward to hearing how you go. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, I've got a question, if I may. Go for it. Um, Kiran, so did you, did you encounter any pushback from uh, the developers? And if you did, what, what are the main criticism of not using ADR? Or, what, or did they come up with any good excuses for <laughs> avoiding to use an ADR, for example? We, we've been pretty lucky. Um, I, I think that everybody acknowledged that there were problems. And I think that a lot of people were happy to jump on board if it meant that their pull requests were going to get reviewed more consistently. Yep. Yep. Uh, and I think also quick feedback. Like we had a lot of tooling problems, to be honest. The customer picked some pretty horrible tools, uh, which were now off. Um, which prevented us from sort of enforcing some of these checks. But overall, people have been pretty receptive. Um, one thing that I, I found we needed was to have our senior management, our stakeholders kind of encourage people to get on board. Often what I say is a good idea isn't always like accepted um, until like influencers above me say, <laughs> this is a good idea, you should do it. Um, but... You know, hearts and minds, I think. It, internal brown bags on the, on the approach um, is yep. probably one, one thing I would, have, would recommend. Um, and, you know, showing people how it can get them moving faster uh, is the other one. You'll notice as well that, that Git one is actually superseded. We actually use it as a stepping stone to moving to conventional Git commits. Um, so you don't have to do big bang all of the time to get everybody on board. Uh, so, you know, conventional commits are, are a predefined standard and it's a lot easier for us to, to go to that with an intermediary step where it could be easier for people to understand what we're trying to achieve. Uh, for, right. Lucky for us, Terraform Enterprise doesn't support conventional commits for releases. So that was a logical step for us. Okay, thanks. Got one other question that was asked in the chat. Uh, from Jim, he said, hi, Kieran, do you think that the ADR is suitable for small scale teams like less than 10 devs and designers? Great presentation, by the way, thanks. Thank you, um, I think so. Um, I, I think that as soon as you have more than, you know, a couple of people, um, it, it gets hard to scale, you know, some of the decisions and if people want to go and leave and, and things like that. Um, I actually was looking around at other ADR presentations and I saw this really great slide that I wanted to steal but I was like no I'll make it all my own content and it was like one of these like cavemen pointing to um to you know a cave uh, to a painting on the wall and there were a whole bunch like there was like three other people on the ground watching him you know and he was drawing some like SQL databases and how they go together on you know and I was like it's that tribal knowledge I think the sooner you can probably write stuff down, the better. Because uh, it's like three people, sure, four, five, it gets challenging. Awesome. All right, any last questions for Kieran before we wrap this up? All right, sounds like we are done with the questions. Well, again, Kieran, thank you so much. It was a really fantastic presentation. And if you look in the chat, uh, things have gone off there, so lots of uh, lots of great conversation happening. <laughs> Actually, just found the chat button. That <laughs> mythical man, month, man, that mythical man month is the thing that that spawned this conversation at this customer. Um, the one we used to say was, you know, you can't have um, you was it um, nine women can't have a baby in one month. It was the other one that used to uh, to come up a lot. So, so yeah. Amen. All right. Thank you very much, Kieran. I am gonna. Kick you off and I'm just going to add 
one last thing before we wrap up. Um, so if you've been inspired by any of the talks tonight and you're keen to uh, maybe give your own presentation about ADR or DevSecOps or any other DevOps related topic, uh, our next meetup is going to be in October. So we're always on the third Thursday of the month. Uh, we'd love to have you speak. If you're keen to do that, please hit me up either through meetup or via email and uh, love to get you locked in. All right, that's it for tonight. Thank you so much for coming and uh, see you online in October. Thanks, everyone. Cheers, all. Thank See you. Ya. Cheers, Karen.